The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode four of season two of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have another jam-packed episode here. I feel like I'm kind of hitting my stride with this new format, but, you know, please let me know if there's anything you'd like to see more of or less of or other topics you might want me to cover. But in this episode, we've got everything from a bunch of news to talk about. We've got if I did the uh, comparison of steel versus brass hoops on Tom's, we're going to wrap up our feature interview with Andy Watson with Tom Went. I've got a, a simple little lesson on how to build up your single stroke roll. I've got a ton of listener questions. We've got part two of our drum mechanics with Brandon Green. But before we get into all of that, let's uh, shout out to our intro beat. This is coming from Eric Toombs. Eric is another Drum Club Project participant, and this was another beat submitted for that. We just announced... Um, actually, I got to put that on the Drum Factor Direct pages now, but we just announced the next Drum Club project meeting, which is on a Thursday. We usually do them on Sundays, but this is going to be on a Thursday, September 15th. So if you want to participate, download the beat from the Big Fat Snare Drum Instagram page, and I'll make sure to put it up on the Drum Factor Direct page as well. All you have to do is download the beat, record yourself playing to it, post it on Instagram, use the hashtag the drum club project. And then if you want to join the Zoom meeting on the 15th, we'll send you the link and we can just come hang out. So that that beat was Eric Toombs. So let's just let Eric discuss his gear and everything that was going on. Hello, my name is Eric Toombs. I reside in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I spend most of my time teaching and playing with various groups. The intro recording that you're listening to is one that I did for the Drum Club project recorded right here in my home studio. The gear I'm using is a Yamaha Birch Custom Absolute Kit, a 6.5 by 14 Ludwig Black Beauty snare. I'm using 14 inch New Beats and a 19 inch K Dark Crash and a 22 K Light Ride. The close mics are Audix and I'm using an SE2200 large diaphragm for my overhead. I also put a small condenser mic in the bathroom joining the wall with my studio. This kind of gave me a natural reverb that I couldn't get from my room. My approach to the groove was keep it simple, keep it interesting, and have it slowly build throughout. I did draw some inspiration to splash quarter notes with my hi-hat foot. This was something that I started practicing when I saw Rodney Holmes do it at a Modern Drummer Festival several years ago. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool then and I've been practicing it ever since. And this was a good time to use it. I hope you liked it and thanks for listening. Thanks Eric, that's a sweet beat. You know that Rodney Holmes uh, Modern Drummer Festival performance you're referencing, I got to introduce Rodney at the show that year and got to stand right beside him when he played that amazing solo. It was absolutely fantastic. He's, his drum sounded so good, just acoustically on stage. Some of the best sounds I've ever heard. So that was a cool one to check out. So thanks, Eric. Let's move into some news. I've got a bunch of random things here. Most of these are new records. I've seen to be noticing a lot more albums are coming out. I guess everyone made records over the pandemic and they're finally getting released with proper you know, pu- you know publicity campaigns. But one we've got here is Jeff Coffin, the saxophonist. Um, I guess he's still involved with the Dave Matthews Band. I, I'm not quite sure, but great saxophonist. He has a new record called Between Dreaming and Joy, and it features both Keith Carlock and the great Chester Thompson on drums. So check that out. Again, that's Jeff Coffin, Between Dreaming and Joy. Let's see. We've got another one here. Oh, a new book, Sandy Gennaro, um, amazing rock drummer who, gosh, he was Cindy Lauper, Joan Jett, um, Bo Diddley, just a great career. He put a book out. It's called Beat the Odds in Business and Life. So if you want to check that out, that's Sandy Gennaro's new book, Beat the Odds in Business and Life. For all my friends in the D.C. area, the Northern Virginia, Maryland, D.C., the D.C. Jazz Fest is happening down on the wharf this weekend. There's a, I mean, the lineup is insane, but if you if you want to catch David Throckmorton, one of our, our guests here, occasional guests on the show, 
co-host. We do the 10 Reasons to Love. He's been interviewing some drummers for the show as well. He's also one of my personal favorite drummers on the planet. He's going to be performing there with the Dan Wilson group. I believe it's a quartet, and that's on Sunday afternoon, I think 2 o'clock. But just go check out the lineup. If you're in the D.C. area, go to that festival, support, um, say what's up to David, let him know that you're a fan of the show. Uh, he's absolutely amazing player, as oh, is everyone else. I mean, Christian McBride's on the lineup. It's just an insane, insane lineup. So if you're in a D.C. area this weekend, go check out the D.C. Jazz Fest. What's next? We've got some more great records. Miguel Zenon put out a record called Musica de las Americas that features the really fantastic drummer Henry Cole. Uh, I've been listening to that. It's like it's modern jazz with with Latin influences. So it's not it doesn't sound like Latin music to me, like traditional Latin music. It's it's just modern contemporary music with, you know, Latin influences. Henry's absolutely fantastic musician. So check that out. That's Miguel Zenon, Musica de las Americas. What else we got here? Legendary jazz drummer Al Foster has a new record out called Reflections that features Nicholas Payton, Chris Potter, Kevin Hayes, and Vincent Archer. That's a really, really great, you know, just classic post-bop modern jazz record. It's by Al Foster called Reflections. Um, Chris Parker, the great New York bass drummer. He was in Stuff back in the day with Steve Gadd. I believe he was in the, the Saturday Night Live band for a long time. He has a trio record. It's called Tell Me, so check that out by the Chris Parker Trio. Oh, Clarence Penn, another fantastic modern jazz drummer. He's on a new record by guitarist Gene S. That's Gene, G-E-N-E, last name S-E-S-S. -S. It's called Ah Bop. That has Scott Coley on bass and Clarence Penn on drums. Classic guitar trio format, another fantastic listen. Check that one out. Oh, modern metal great Slipknot. They've got, they just put a new rec, a new, a new video for a song called Yen. They've got a new album coming out at the end of September called The End So Far. They also have a whole bunch of tour dates, and that features Jay Weinberg on drums. Amazing, amazing drummer. Um, so check that out if you're a fan of the band Slipknot. They've got a new video out now. A new record comes out in a few weeks, and they're going to be on tour starting September 20th. So go check out Jay Weinberg. Just absolutely kill it with Slipknot while wearing a mask, which has to be completely exhausting. <laughs> On the gear front, I saw the D-Drum just put out a new SE Flyer pit stop kit in a vintage sparkle finish. This is a really compact small kit. It has a 15 by 16 bass drum, 7 by 10 mounted tom, 12 by 13 floor tom, and a 6 by 13 snare. They all come with poplar shells, 45 degree bearing edges, Remo heads. Yeah, it's a good quality compact kit, and we sell a lot of D-Drum replacement parts as well. So if you have a D-Drum kit, maybe that needs some new stuff, check our website, drumfactordrink.com. We probably have it in stock, or we can get it. Or if you want a new kit, this looks really fun. Little compact kit. I've got a I've got a similar size kit that I need to get back in here that I start using soon. But go check that out. That's the D Drum S E Flyer Pit Stop. Another great record that I can't wait to hear. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Lewis Cole has a new LP quality over opinion. His first single, I'm Tight, is out now. It's Lewis Cole. I mean, he's just a great, great artist. I mean, I, I hate to just say drummer because he does everything, but he's a great drummer, great songwriter, great just contemporary artists so check that out lewis cole that comes out october 14th the record comes out and but the single i'm tight is out now go check that out one of my favorite metal bands mastodon just put out is it out now so yeah they just put out a documentary for the making of hushed and grim bron daler is a one i mean he might be my favorite modern metal drummer just super fun but yeah, they also have a tour launching at the end. Oh, I guess now they're on tour now. But yeah, check out this this making of. I personally love making of documentaries. So it's called The Making of Hushed and Grim by Mastodon. Check out Ron Daler making the record. All right, I think that covers all of the news. It's funny because each week I'm like, oh, there's not going to be any news for the show. And then by Monday, I have a stack of stuff. So there's a lot of great music coming out, a lot of bands on the road. So make sure you get out and support live music as much as you can. Again, I'm going to say it again. If you're in the D.C. area, go to the D.C. Jazz Fest, especially on Sunday. Say what's up to Throck. And uh, OK, let's move on. So it's time for our main topic. All right, I wanted the bulk of season two to focus on everything you need to know about snare drums. But last week, we got a really interesting question up from Jeff Costello about, should I put brass hoops on my toms? And I originally said, no, probably not. But I figured we might as well just go ahead and do the experiment since we have the stock. Let's do it. So in this section, I'm swapping out the batter hoop on a 12-inch maple tom from steel, triple flange steel, 
to triple flange solid brass chromed so chrome over brass so here we go so we're going to step away from exploring different elements of the snare drum for this main segment to go back to a question that i got um we got last week as a listener question i believe from jeff costello would it make a difference to put brass hoops on toms versus steel hoops my guess was um i that you're not going to hear enough of a difference to justify the expense because the brass hoops are so much more expensive. But I figured why not actually go through and do the testing? We have you all here, so let's do it. So what I've got here is a regular, this is a 12 inch Tom, 10 ply, thin 10 ply Keller shell maple um, with six lugs. So I've got, I want to keep the steel triple flange on the bottom. We're only going to mess with the top. Uh, maybe if there's a huge sonic difference when we put the brass on, maybe I'll try the brass on the bottom as well. But we're just going to focus on the top. So six lug maple drum, probably what most of us have, 10 ply, thin ply. Um, and drum head wise, let me get this back on the stand first. Drum head I'm going to put, it has a, has a clear ambassador on the bottom that's been on there for a long time. I'm going to put this. Um, this is Drum Factory Direct DH004, I believe. It's the 10 mil single ply coated batter head. So we're going to put that on there. Um, let's take a look at the hoops because I have them both here. One of these is steel and one of these is brass. Question is, which one is which? So they look identical. They're both triple flange with a chrome plating. Um, this one's older, so this must be the steel one because it's what was on the drum. This is the brand new one of the brand new ones. So what's the difference? Um, they feel pretty similar to me in the hands. I don't know that if you said pick which one is heavier just by feel, they feel pretty similar. They look similar. Um, big difference is the way they resonate. So I've got this overhead mic here. See if you can hear that. So that's that one. I won't tell you which one it is yet. Let's do the other one. <laughs> it probably sounds pretty crazy in the microphone, but so I'm just hitting it with a rubber tip on these practice sticks and then with the stick itself. That's one hoop. Drop a stick, and then here's the other one. So it's pretty obvious to me this one doesn't ring as musically or as evenly or as long as this one. Way more bell like, more chime like, way more overtones, much longer sustain. This is the brass, the one that has a, has a lower pitch, but less complex sound. Is it lower pitch? Now I'm getting myself confused. Yeah. So the steel has a lower pitch, less overtones, shorter ring, just doesn't vibrate quite as much. So we're gonna put the steel back on to get our kind of bass line. For reference, I'm tuning this drum right in the middle of its register, which happened to be 200 hertz. If you tune the, um, the pitch of the tension rods using the TuneBot or a chromatic tuner, you know, the overtone that you hear right by the tension rods is at 200 hertz on the bottom. So I'm just going to match it with the top, make them both exactly 200. So then we're going to hear, you know, what this drum sounds like with maximum sustain right in the middle of the register of the drum so not too high not too low and then kind of give our our face comparison our baseline so then we can compare with the brass hoop microphone wise i have a austrian audio cc8 overhead and exact same mic austrian audio cc8 on the tom it's about two and a half inches above the hoop kind of aimed midway between the center and the edge of the drum. 
So give me a minute here to tune it up and we'll see what we get. All right, I got it tuned up. It didn't take much, just maybe like a three quarter of a turn up from finger tight to get it to 200 Hertz. Hit the tension rods, which I find this to be right in the middle of the register. Let's just listen to the drum. I'm gonna play some center hits, hit some rim shots, um, and then we will swap it out for the brass. So let's check it out. Sounds like a tom, right? The sustain is nice and pure. It rings to me just long enough, but it definitely decays, I don't know, relatively quickly. But let's just see if putting the, the brass version of this triple flange hoop on top does anything to the sound. So I'm gonna swap this one off and we'll see in a second. Okay, the brass hoop is now on the drum. It is tuned up to 200 Hertz at the tension rods. Let's see if there's any difference. Okay, so you have to tell me. It was kind of tough for me to tell because I had to spend a couple minutes swapping the hoops. I couldn't do it immediately back and forth, but what I think I heard was the brass hoop allowed the drum head to vibrate more, which wasn't necessarily a good thing to my ear in this particular situation. I felt like the steel might have contained the sound a little bit more, a little bit better for me, at least from the playing perspective. We'll see what the microphone picked up, but you know, the brass hoop sounded a bit like maybe there's a little bit more distortion in the the vibration of the head maybe that means just more more sustain more overtone but let's do a quick cut so we're going to do single hit steel single hit brass back and forth let's see if we can really hear a difference here we go so it'll be steel first and then brass steel and then brass I don't know about you, but I'm not really hearing enough of a difference to make me want to swap out all of my steel hoops on my toms with brass versions. There's a difference. Um, maybe it's just because I'm more familiar with the way that the steel responds and sounds. I like this drum with steel hoops on it. So even if given the choice, I would probably just stick with the steel. So, you know, you can let me know what you think. Maybe, maybe brass is the answer. Maybe higher tunings, brass would be more important. But when we come back to the snare drum and we start experimenting with different hoop styles and types, I think that's when the brass is really going to be much more apparent. But stay tuned for that. So there you have it. Does a brass hoop sound better than a steel hoop on a tom? Inconclusive, personal opinion, nope. I am very curious about whether or not you could hear a difference between the hoops um, first time through i thought no i can't hear anything second time through just listening i was like i think i really hear a difference and the brass does sound better is it is it make it worth it to spend the extra money on the hoops that's up for you to decide i'm just happy to do the experiment so you don't have to waste the money and then be frustrated or be excited to try them out we do still have some of these chrome over brass hoops i would save them for your snare drums which we will definitely do soon but let's move on it's time to wrap up our interview with andy watson so this is the second part of Tom Wentz hang with the great, great uh, jazz drummer, Andy Watson. Hope you enjoy this chat. Let's get right to it.
Could you talk a little bit about how you how you work with the lead trumpet player in a big band? What are some of the things you listen for? What are some of the things that that make your job either easier or more difficult? Because I think that's that's an important relationship in a big band between us and the lead player. What are what are, what are some of the what are some of the things that you think about as far as that goes? Um, primarily, what I'm trying to do, and we talked about this earlier, is give him space to play the way he wants to. Gotcha. The last thing I want to do is try to dictate all his entrances, all the you know, and, and, and all the you know the middle part of a phrase. I want to leave him alone to play his part. Um, as drummers, we know that it's harder for us. I mean, a brass player can get all of these different attacks very easily. As drummers, if we're trying to catch, you know, all of those different, you know, note lengths and stuff like that, you know, with a snare drum, you've got basically a short sound, you know, and if you want to get a long sound, you do have to buzz, you know, or or you can play out toward the rim and it'll make it a little longer, but it's still kind of a short note. Sure. You know, so I try to stay out of the way, especially during uh, when when there are a lot of short notes happening. Okay. My concept of, of, of I'm kind of sort of getting off the topic, but that's okay. I I don't like to to try to play short notes with uh, a lead trumpet player or a brass section because if I play all of mine, which are ultra short it makes things sound stiff wow you know at short notes there's a range of of you know notes that you know there's the really short staccato ones and then there are ones that are a bit more legato they, they should be able to make that difference without me getting involved in making them making them all sound like you know this wow yeah okay? yeah so what i try to do then is um when he's playing a line or an ensemble figure, I my concept is get him started and help him finish. Ah, and I weight the the long notes within a phrase. Wow. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, so get him started might mean just play a setup, crash on one, let them have it, and then if there's a long note somewhere toward the end of the phrase, I'll deal with that. Maybe set that in a way or maybe just play it but i like to leave all of that middle stuff for them to interpret like they want which makes for a loose kind of ensemble feel man yeah so that's that's what i'm doing you know that's what i'm doing with the lead trumpet player and there's a lot of stuff too like you can look over visually and see exactly where they're going to put something or if they you feel them maybe want to lay something back you know you take a look at them all right lay it back i'm gonna just wait on you yeah plenty of time just wait on you wait on you wait on you i'll catch the last one even if that's still laid back too but i've still got it here and you know then it comes back like the rubber band wow man that's that's incredibly insightful that's that's some really valuable stuff and 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 i hear you i i i totally appreciate the giving them space to sort of interpret it the way they want, but you kind of start it and then you help them sort of put the period on the, on the phrase, so to speak. Right. Wow, man, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. One of these days I should, you know, nobody, I don't think anyone has ever, or maybe they have, and I haven't seen, you know, disclaimer, but I don't think a book has been written as like a, Kind of a, a book of advice about dealing with with big band figures you know what which ones you know here's what we're looking at on the page what do you play yeah with I the, think, you know, recorded examples of like different drummers and how they dealt with it yes yes maybe uh you know one of these days i'll get off my ass and try to write something like that i think but, i think you're the man to do it man you have you've played with so many different big bands you'd be the perfect guy to do it i i would buy a copy man <laughs> mail me some strong coffee <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. That's that. That's a lot of work, but man, that would be a wonderful resource for for younger drummers. I I, I struggle with students of my own. You know, I I try to tell them to you know to to 
as far as playing figures with a big band to 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 match the kind of figures, you know, the longs and the shorts. But that whole idea of 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 giving giving the uh, the horn players space in order to to sort of phrase the way they want that's that's really insightful man i i i appreciate that because that i hear what you're saying and it's, it's an important thing um yeah that's get started on the book man i'll buy one because <laughs> i need it too i need it <laughs> so um you know, just just to kind of shift shift gears a little bit, man. I I know uh, just from from seeing so you know some of the things that you've you've posted on social media over the last few years. You're a, you're a Wilcoxon guy like I am, and I was wondering if you could sort of talk about uh, how working on the Char- the Charlie Wilcox and stuff has sort of uh, you know helped your playing. What, what what are some of the things that you feel that you really get out of working on on that 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 stuff? Just. Uh... You know, their fluidity, I think, yeah. around it, you know, and that's that's some stuff that if you, you know, once you you work it, it you get so much from it. You get like the, the conditioning for your hands. Then once you take it off of there, a lot of the stuff, you know, applies directly to the drum set. And sure. you know, Philly Joe was, as we all know, the master at using those kind of things and they sound great. Yeah. So, but you know, it, it keeps your hands in shape. It's great for you know being able to accent any note that you want to accent. You yep. know, the sticking yep. pattern that you can use in any way your imagination lets you. So, yeah, yeah I, you know, I I love playing Wilcox and things. Yeah, me too. When you when you work on them, do you do you just work on them on a pad, or do you put them on a snare drum, or do you apply them to the drum set in some kind of way? How do you practice that stuff? Um, mostly on a pad, um, yeah. but I find that when I practice on a pad too much, I, I always, you know, and it's not necessarily all bad, but I play a lot stronger than I do when I'm playing on the drum. So me therefore. Too. When you get to the drum, you know, you've been practicing this stuff, man, I've got, you know, I'm wailing on this. But then you go to the drum and you have to play it at like a, a volume that, you know, we, we play at. It's like yeah. you're all tied up because your hands can't execute it when you're playing lighter. Yeah. So I, I also play them, you know, on the snare drum, you know, yeah. often as I can. Yeah, I do the same. Can. Yeah. And, and, I've also uh, started uh, pretty recently uh, doing them again with brushes. Oh, yeah. Yep. I've done a little bit of that. And it's, man, is it challenging, but it's really yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I noticed you, you, you're you both a, a, a traditional grip and a match grip player. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. How, how did you develop that? Was that something that you sort of did simultaneously or did you start out a traditional grip player and then switch to match or vice versa? How did that develop? When I started with the the guy I mentioned before, Harold Wendell, if I had, uh, you know, uh, gone in and, and tried to play match grip, he would have probably sent me home. <laughs> so so I, I started, you know, playing traditional grip and did okay. that. I remember the first time um, it was at Allstate Band one year I saw a kid play you know, match grip. And I went up to one of the other drummers, like, this guy plays that way. They go, match grip. And I said, what's that? Wow. So anyway, until I was, uh, I guess, in in high school, I played traditional grip. And then uh, I started using match, you know, high school. And I found that uh, for me, just I, I can be more consistent rhythmically. Interesting. Especially with uh, playing uh, louder, I find that you know, and I, 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 this is like a war that I've been doing with myself for <laughs> thirty-five years. I love playing traditional grip. Yeah, you know, I love the way it feels when there's some. I think you get so many more subtleties out of it with comping, that kind of thing. And you know, there, there's a snap to it with. You know, soloing, especially when you employ any of the rudimental stuff, you just don't get that with traditional grip. I mean, you just don't get that with match grip. But, you know, when it comes time to play, uh, you know, like the whole pandemic, for instance, I played nothing but traditional grip. It's like, I got all this time. I'm going to get this together. 
Wow. So just do what I want to do the rest of my career. <laughs> so, then we start doing gigs again. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I go for something and it doesn't quite work out. It's like, oh, man. So yeah. I'm back to this for a while. Yeah. So my, my, my thing now is uh, I want to be like uh, – I want to have a lot of like I'm a baseball fan, so I want to I want to have a lot of pitches in my arsenal. Yes, so sir. now it's like you know, from this point on, I'm I'm going to practice both equally. Wow. So I can I can you know hopefully comp this way if it feels right, comp this way if it feels right, you know. The, yeah. The, you know, ensemble this way, you know, so where I can do it without feeling like oh my god, I haven't played traditional grip in four days and my hand won't work. Right. You know? Right, right. I, I was noticing on Sunday that, that that you were switching pretty frequently, and I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't seen you play live in so long. I was I was curious to see how you were going to do that, and it was really interesting. But now, after hearing your explanation, it makes it makes total sense. Um, while we're talking about practicing, could could you talk a little bit about your? We've talked about Wilcoxon, obviously, but when it comes to practicing today, what are some of the other things that you work on and that you do? Uh, I have a copy of Dave Tuff's Daredevil book. Have you seen Do you it? really? No, I, I've heard about it. I would love to see it. I've, I've never seen a copy, but I know about it. I'll, uh, I'll send you one. Dave, oh, man. Dave's estate, don't sue me. Okay. I, I have uh, my drum <laughs> teacher at University of South Carolina is named Jim Hall. So he gave me uh, a couple of years ago like scans of this whole book that he had. I remember oh, wow. throwing it from him when I was studying with him for a while. So yeah. I printed them out, put them together. So I've been working on those things for, you know, wow. maybe six months or so. And they're wow. great. Wow. Really a great book that I don't know why it's not more, you know, in, uh, more it's not more widely used yeah I've, I've heard about it for years but i've never actually seen a copy of it i've, I've heard nothing but great things about it that's really yeah. cool so so what do you do with it do you just you work on a pad or do you apply it to the kit uh i've basically just been at this point i'm working my i'm almost through it i'm working my way through just on a pad you know nice i you know make sure i write down the the tempo that I'm comfortable doing the exercises with. And then, you know, after I go, I'll go back and maybe try to do set up a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What yeah. else, what, what else do you work on, man? Practice wise. Um, I also, of course, you know, I play with a metronome every day, uh, various tempos. You know, I've always been really religious about that. And I think, oh. I think that helped, helps you, you know, uh, refine your internal clock and in that, you know, you learn over time, you know, what your tendencies are and you yep. really, you know, come to know it's like, oh, okay, you know, you immediately know when something's moving one way or another. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of that, it's, you know, you get that from experience too, but I think this is, a, it's like a reference point that I think is really important to work with. Absolutely. And with that, I'll, you know, I, I uh, solo over it, play time over it. I've also uh, done a lot of uh, loops, like I'll record a vamp, I'll sing a vamp of some sort, you know, a few times and then loop that and play over it. Wow. Know, just to, you know, help with playing over vamps or, you know, like odd, you know, odd meters, put an odd meter you know, vamp together so you can get a, a better handle, feel more comfortable with that. How do you do that? How, like, what do you use to do that with, if you don't I mind me asking? A, just a Zoom recorder, Zoom H3, I think it is. Oh, okay. Wow. Nice. And I just sing into it. And then there's a function where you can do, um, you know, you can make it loop. Wow. Yeah, it, it, you, you, A, B, it gives you a point where A is the start, B is the end. And then yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's man, that's really cool. I yeah, I I should think about doing something like that because I hear you. I I don't play, I don't play a lot of music that's in like multiple odd meters, but it's really great to work on because it really sort of widens your your sort of musical lens, so to speak. You know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, and then, well, let me. Yeah. Before, I'll tell you one more thing. No, I, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm a big one for playing with records. I mean, me too. 
Yeah. At least half, at least half, probably more of my practice time every day. I'm playing with records, whether that be small group things, and I try to use that with, uh, you know, stuff I haven't heard. Put it on and then play with it and make it like for ear training, say. Wow! Yeah. Or Man. also, uh, you know, like same thing with uh, with big band things. I'll either I, I'm a big one for these days taking pictures of of arrangements. You know, especially you know, the classic ones. Well, I'll, I'll take the pictures and you know, and, and you know, practice with. You know, I'm a big one for you know doing my my big band homework. Let's say. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it it shows, man. Wow, that's great. That's that's really interesting. That you said a few things that I that that I wasn't expecting, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so so we've got a few minutes left, man, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um the the drums you play, the cymbals you play, and how you tune your drums because you have such a, a a beautiful sound, man, between both the drums and the cymbals. Could you talk a little bit? Let's maybe start with the drums. How do you sort of approach tuning um your kit? Um I approach it quite often in that uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I, I play cap heads. I know, yeah. You're constantly yeah. tweaking. Yeah. Both sides of the bass drum and then toms and the snare drum cap on the batter side. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, in certain types of weather, and it's a beautiful sound, you can have cap on the resonating side of the toms anyway, too, but... You know, uh, in in like weather like we're dealing with now, that would mean like turning the tom over in the middle of a set. And so that's yeah. just a little more, you know, yeah. the top you learn to deal with. So because of that, I've never been one to like try to tune to specific pitches. Uh, I just, you know, I threw an amount of turns from, you know, where the drum sits, you know, when it's resting, mm -hmm. I always uh, with calf you have to detune after you after you bring them up, or otherwise the heads stretch out and you have to retuck them if you know how or by a uh, by a new head. Yeah. So but anyway, from the resting position, I know pretty much like uh, the amount of turns it's going to take to get the drum within a range to where it sounds good. Okay. Um, I always go small group or big band. I go on the lower side of. It. Sure. And it's yeah. like, I like the richness, especially with cap heads that you get when the drums are tuned down low. So, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful sound for sure. And I I, I think everybody should uh, should buy a, a cap head at least for their snare drum, just because of what it'll teach you about tuning the drum. I mean, you, you in short order learn about all the, the relationships between the pitches of both heads. And wow. how it affects the sounds. I mean, you know, it really it's a crash course because you're tuning all the time. Yeah, you know, I, I've wanted to do that for years, actually, is to get a calf head just for the snare drum for just exactly what you're talking about. So that that that's reconfirming, uh, you, you know, that I need to do that because that's that's it's interesting. It, it behaves so differently than plastic. Um as far as the snare drum goes, when you're using a calf head how do, is is the relationship between the top and bottom head any different than on the tom toms or the bass drum because of the snares? How does that come into play with a calf head? Um, I like a really well. It depends on the drum too. I like a a tight to very tight snare head. Yeah. And here again, it just depends on whichever drum I'm using. So, but you know, the 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 batter head is. Uh, I, I like to keep, you know, fairly slack, fairly low pitched. Yep. You know, so the toms, I found that if you, uh, if you go extreme, if you like have the, the bottom head really, uh, really loose, then you, you get a lot more uh, definition, you know, so that, that on the toms, I'm, I'm like the opposite. Most of the time, the bottom heads are looser and the top heads are tighter. Just because I don't want to me, it's like the ultimate, you know, let's let's just drop it out. To me, I don't understand why they've they've sold us on like 
resonating systems, you know, for your toms, we have these, you know, full resonance mounts. <laughs> the drum will ring from now until three o'clock. <laughs> and then, then they sell you moon gel and stuff like that to cut down on some of the resonance. It's like, wait a minute. You know, you're getting, it's, you're getting me going and coming here. Yeah. So with, with this, you know, I, I just find that the, the, the slack bottom head for my toms and the bass drum too give me a, a drier sound. Yeah. It's musical. That, you know, we look at it, um, jazz is an eighth note, jazz that swings is an eighth note bass music. And if the toms ring too much, you're not playing a convincing eighth note. Mm. You know, you're, you're, you, you, you know, you have to, let's say you're not playing. You're making yourself work a lot harder to play convincing eighth note. There so, you go. You know, I like having that, the, the, you know, the, the kind of natural dryness there. That, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's such a mystery today. There's, there's so much, like you said, there's all these conflicting messages that drummers get and, and so many younger guys, uh, you know, they, they, they want to muffle everything and tune it so high and you don't get any sound out of the instrument that way. And that really affects, I think how so many younger drummers play. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to bash them at all, but it's, it's almost like they're, they're, they're hurting their, their chances of, you know, for success. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard a lot of older drummers, you know, you know, say, you know, you, you, you can really tell the skill of a drummer when they're playing, you know, a drum set with coated heads, everything is open. You can really hear what kind of touch they have and what kind of sound they get, you know, and that's, I think that's probably magnified even more with calf. Would you, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you're not, especially if you, if you like to tune them kind of low, you know, you're, you're wor working hard for your money, you, you know, pull technical things off because it, it, you know, it's like a, if you can imagine a, uh, a pad that's really soft sure you, know, you got to work harder to, to pull the notes out yeah so, yeah, yeah i agree with that yeah yeah it's but, a it's a great thing yep one thing that i i want to mention too is uh i'm always not always but a lot of times frustrated with uh with bass drums and the way people tune them it's like especially as a person who plays with with big band I've got to be able to get both a long and a short note out of my bass drum to match up with, you know, the articulation of the horns as best I can. But like so many times we were talking about this on on Sunday, so many times you get with uh, drum kits on the road or, you know, drum sets and clubs, you get a bass drum that's heavily muffled. So it's like you've taken away half of my options. Wow. Yeah. You know? Yep. So that that to me is like you know come on you know nothing to me is worse I, I you know and I've heard really good drummers you know recordings of them doing this where they're they're playing in a big band and there's a long note and they've got a bass drum that goes it's like man you're not playing a long note you know the cymbal wow. will not get that completely across for you you gotta have some ring in the bass drum to match that up and if you don't. What do we do? We go back to the thing I was talking about. If you make all the short notes, it sounds stiff. If you yeah. make long notes short, it sounds stiff. Man, so. yeah. You know, I noticed that on Sunday, you know, we were playing the same kit and I used more muffling when I played. And when, when you sat down, I watched you take the towel a little off and I thought, oh yeah, okay. Because I, when I was playing my set, I wasn't very comfortable with just the way it sounded on stage. I didn't trust that the drum needed a little bit more air. I, I, I got too nervous and I muffled it more. And I, when I saw you do that, I was like, man, and I, I went out front and listened and I was like, there it is that that's that's the correct sound so i when i told you i got a free lesson on sunday i wasn't lying man because that 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 really i was like son of a gun i should have i shouldn't have muffled it quite so much but it was just my own little personal um discomfort i i wasn't trusting you know the instrument to do what it needed to do well you certainly sounded comfortable 
<laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But the sound, like I, you know, when I when I got out there, I didn't have quite as much muffling, and I played the first tune, and I was like, ah, I don't like how that feels. But I should have, right. I should have, I should have trusted that the instrument was going to sound right out front, and that's that. That was a great. That was a great lesson. So thank you. <laughs> One other thing that, you know, I probably sound like a calfskin head salesman. I mean, I mean okay. uh, no, a lambsville beater salesman. That's all right. But with, with the lambsville beater, you can use that little ring of, uh, of uh, lambsville around the, the, you can use that to muffle a head. Ah. So when you play a long note, you can bring it back and muffle. Or when you play a, you want a short note, you can leave the beater in, but you don't get the buzz like you do with uh you know, on a on a uh, a head that has some you know resonance to it. If you leave a felt beater there, a lot of times you get the buzz. Absolutely. The, with the lambs, well, you hold it in for a sec, and you get a, sh- a short note. Yeah, I, I but, have no. Know, I have. Sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. That's okay. I was just going to say I, I I don't have any experience with those beaters, and I I should get one and and start messing with it because you you were getting such a great sound, and I used your beater during yeah. my set, and it felt great. I thought like, man, these these feel really good, you know. But I for some reason I've always been a little a little skittish about trying them. But you're 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 making me think, which is good, you know. Before they break in, um, they are. You know, it's it's kind of rough because you're not getting any definition on even your loud notes. So and that and that and that's what's what's kept me from getting one. Yeah. So just you know, I have like my gamers, and then I have the ones that I'm. It's like a baseball player, you know, getting his glove together. He's got his gamers, and he's got the ones that he's you know tying up with the baseball line to get ready. You practice with it until you get that little. It starts wearing off. You know. Maybe yeah. Through, you know, depending on week maybe a couple weeks you'll have that little uh you know section that's uh worn down enough to where you get you know more definition for the the loudness what's what's the general life of those beaters a- after you get them broken in how about how long do they last before you need to get an, a, a new one uh, i guess it depends on how much you're playing but well uh i would say it just depends on what the under uh, what the beater is made from underneath. If you get okay. a lot of the ones you can buy now, they have wooden beaters underneath and they don't last any time because the wood eats right through the, the coating. And then it's like you're playing with a wooden beater. So, yeah. Um, the ones with felt, that lasts a couple of years, I guess, maybe, maybe a year and a half. Okay. And that another thing I, I learned how to do in I guess in self defense was I learned how to sew beer covers. Ah, it's not it's not very hard to do. I mean, even I, I never re- really even sewed a button on anything, but <laughs> you know, I, you know, I I learned how to do it. So every year and a half, I give my beers a retrain. No, so, that's that's really cool. Wow, interesting, man. Well, you know, we could I'm sure we could talk for another several hours about this stuff but i think we're i think our our time is is drawing to a close but before we before we split is there anything you have coming up that you want to plug man you got any gigs or recordings or or anything that you're going to be doing in the next month or so that folks can look out for um i'm going on vacation um the end of this week for for a while but in september on uh, September the 8th, I'm at uh, Smalls with uh, David Bichler's quintet. With, I know uh, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, John Hart, Ugono, Craig Kegwo, um, Scott Winholt, myself, and Bix. That's a great group, man. And as you know, if, if anybody watching this does, if, for anyone watching this who doesn't know, you can watch uh, the Smalls live feed. Yeah. And then a little later on in September, I've got a gig uh, down near Philly with Joe Magnarelli. Um, nice. He's a guy who does a, a jazz series. Uh, so. Beautiful, man. That's fantastic. You know, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on uh, the podcast and talking, man, because as I said to you on Sunday, you know, you're 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 one of the guys who has a lot to give. So we'll, we'll we'll definitely have you back and we'll talk about some other stuff sometime, man. But thank you. Thank you for taking the time, man. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, man. Beautiful. Well, we'll uh, we'll get you back soon. And until then, man, thank you. 
Thank you. And keep swinging. <laughs> All right, man. Thank cool, you. Man. That was fun. Yeah, man. I'm, 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 so I'm brand new at doing stuff like this. So I'm sorry right. for my, 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 my interview skills. I'm still trying to get it together, man, but thank you. That oh, was a I blast. Thought, I thought you were fantastic. Man, that all that stuff you shared, man, about playing within a band, man, that is that is some of the most beautiful insight, man. That's and I try to, you know, I've done I've done two of these other podcasts. I did one with Lewis Nash and one with uh, Reggie Quinterly. And, you know, I, I try to ask questions because I'm thinking of younger and experienced drummers, you know, and trying to, you know, get guys like you who really have that experience to talk about certain things. So, man, that that stuff was gold, man. That's that's hey. really great. Thank you, man. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Here's a short lesson on how to build single stroke roles that aren't, you know, randomly out of time. I know when I personally, when I play I think of a thing, single stroke roll, the way that we kind of learned it traditionally was to go from super slow to super fast. If I ever try to do that in a musical situation, just play a fast single stroke roll, I lose all sense of timing and pulse. And that makes me really, really anxious. So this exercise is just designed to maintain a sense of pulse while developing your single stroke roll. It's really short, really basic, but it's super crucial. At least it was for me. So here you go, single stroke roll builder. One of the most difficult things about the single stroke roll is maintaining a sense of pulse when you play it rather than having your hands just flutter out of control, always knowing what subdivision you're playing for the tempo that you're in. So one exercise I do often in my own practice and with students is to build up the single stroke roll starting with just eighth notes with one hand. So we're going to go 120 BPM and the first thing to do is just play all the eighth notes with one hand. We're going to start with the right. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right? This time we're going to fill in one sixteenth note in the beginning, repeat it a few times, keep adding the sixteenth note until we eventually land on a full measure of sixteenths. Three, four. One, two, three, four. Tube notes. Back to eighth notes and then switch hands. Now the left is leading. Get that locked in. One, two, three, four. Add another one. Another one. hands again. Take it slowly. Again, I'm at 120. You might want to go a little bit slower than that to start. The point is to maintain a strong sense of pulse to be super accurate and then gradually increase the speed as you get comfortable with it. And then your single stroke roll will just sound way more intentional and deliberate and you'll never lose the sense of the pulse. Now it is time for part two of Drum Mechanics with Brandon Green. Brandon Green is a fantastic drummer. He's also a trainer and a f exercise expert and he just knows how the body functions really really well all based on science not just theories so this is the second part of our hour-long chat enjoy all right let's move on to pedal positioning do you i mean this is something i i suffer from a lot when i sit behind a house kit is having to adjust my body to the kit and instead of thinking about actually just moving the bass drum or whatever so how do you approach placing the pedals well, I mean, if you don't want me asking you, like when you go to a house kit, what do you like? What kind of things are set up that you find yourself moving your body around for? Uh, I don't move the bass drum, so like just that position. Yeah, just sitting maybe too close to it. It's aiming straight ahead, so I'm having to twist my torso to get in the proper position. All right. I often don't well, move anything. 
Perfect. Well, I'm glad we're going to do this over camera so you don't have to smell my shoe. <laughs> so um, the best way that I can answer this, so first and foremost, width-wise, uh, we have inherent restrictions of where the pedals are going to be width-wise because we've usually got a 13 or 14 at snare drum in between our legs, which always kind of brings up an interesting conversation because like, I have a, a woman client that I see and she's in her 70s, so she's definitely older, but she can't actually open her knees from a seated position wider than 12 inches. Now, that's a special scenario, but if there's anybody out there that just geometry-wise, you can't open your legs wide, funny enough, an actual standard snare drum might be too big, and maybe there's a reason to actually use a 12-inch snare drum and tune it like a 14, but that's a whole other thing. Mm. So the width is a big deal, and that's where once we have that original drum throne height, seeing where your legs sit comfortably is big. And I've done this before. We've talked about this before, but when you're sitting in your drum throne, see how wide you can open your legs and how close you can bring them in to the snare drum. Because if you're a Terry Bozio, Marco Miniman style person with all these pedals on the left side, we actually need to make sure you actually have that range of motion available. But most of us are probably not. Probably double bass, single bass, and a hi-hat. As far as pedal placement goes, where you place, uh, place the bass drum, the simple answer is I would say, make sure that your leg is just bent back just a little bit towards your knee. So instead of having that 90 degree, like if you're sitting at 90 degrees, which we already said you should be at 100, but just to make it visually easy, if you're at 90, your knee shouldn't be at 90, your leg should be out just a little bit. So it actually would be a 100 degree angle at your knee rather than the 90. And the reason why it actually has to do with what the foot can do. In your ankle, we've got two different joints at the back that dictate how much front to back motion we have. The main one is called the talocrural joint, and it's a simple joint that's like a door hinge joint that lets your foot go front to back mostly. There's some obliquity to it, but we'll just go with that. When you move your tibia closer to the toe of your shoe, so you bring your, your, the front of your leg closer to the tip of your shoe, you actually restrict how much dorsiflexion you can get. And so if you need to do this, place your foot on the ground in your chair, slide your knees over your toe. And once your knees over your toe, you can't actually lift your foot at all. And now we're at that extreme of range of motion again, the Goldilocks zone where you physically don't have any range of motion available. And so if you're back just enough that you have just a little motion, this is working in very end range muscles. And the byproduct of this is this is where you get shin splints and tib like shin fatigue very quickly because your muscles don't have a very big range. They're in a shortened position. So the actual skeletal muscle can't relax and produce ATP and actually recover quickly. And you get really, really burning shins. So you want to make sure you've got a little bit of extra space there. And I would say basically at a hundred degree angle from your shoe. What about the hi-hat? You have a mirror image or is it a different thing? Honestly, I would say it's, I would say mirror image in my opinion is the best. Our body, there's the biological law of symmetry. We do well with symmetry. Uh, also, if we're going to be playing lots of long gigs, I think making it as symmetrical as possible. You can get away with it. Like most of us, if you're a foot, high hat, open closer, leg stomper, where you're lifting your leg, you can get away with having it a little bit closer. I know Mark Giuliana keeps his a little bit closer and you can see him pulsing his whole hip. I would advocate for symmetry. But again, if you have the range of motion available and it feels good, like a Mark Giuliana and like someone, any, a lot of these jazz guys, that works, but I'm an advocate of, advocate of symmetry. Does that mean most people have the hi hat too, too close to their body? Is it should it be further away in your mind? In my opinion, they do. Okay. Now, I mean, of course, anyone that's listening to this that has been playing with their hi hat close to them for decades, especially if there's anyone who's remotely good at drums and a professional, they'll tell me I don't know anything I'm talking about, and I'm okay with that. But there are some things that are important. Um, Mechanically, if we're a bit symmetrical, we have way more foot motion, hip motion available. We already covered that. Second, if the hi-hats are too close to you, way more importantly, if you're playing traditionally, like a traditional, I should have had a drumstick right here. If you're playing traditionally and I have a pen in my hand, that means you have to internally rotate your arm and have a stick long enough and an arm long enough to actually hit the hi-hat without getting to a trunk rotated position. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, this is where most people get back problems. It's not just the throne. It's not just where the pedals are. It's the combination of all of those things and then being in an awkward position for a long time. And I know you and anyone else can relate to this. If you went through the high, I mean, you're probably, you're maybe 
the same age as me, maybe a little older. I'm not I'm so older. sure. Could, I'm older. <laughs> but like, I was like fully like Green Day, Blink-182 era. Like that's what got me into the drums. I'm sure a lot of guys who are around the same age as me, like 35, same thing. And the high, high, high hat was a huge thing. And if you ever actually played a gig with your hi hat that high, like up by your eyes or your ears, like your arm got tired. You're like, I just got to do it. Well, though, that's a huge thing. That fatigue is an indicator that that thing is in a position that's just not ergonomically friendly. I went through the other side of it where I tried to play them super low. Dennis Chambers vibe was like, well, how close can I get this thing? And then I found myself in awkward positions. I don't know if I can say that ever, a lot of people have their hi-hats too close to them, but I do think that if someone does have their hi-hat close to them, they either need an extra long stick or you might find them turning a lot more to get there. And that creates a higher opportunity for issues with backs. I mean, you using the late Neil Pert as an example, most of us know that he had some major back issues at the end of touring. Now, Rush, three-hour-long gigs, huge, but his drum set was notorious for having stuff way over here and way over there. And you'd see him, huge tom roll, six inches all the way down. Mm. I'll tell you, you are in this extreme position to pushing as hard, rolling as hard as you can. You go down and around and you do a lot of that stuff. You'll get away with it in your 30s and 40s, but that stuff starts to show up as you get older. Now, all of us are not doing three-hour gigs, for sure, but mm. it does start to show up. I think the twisting thing is important to, to dive into a little bit more, like how, how to prevent that, because I know, I know that's my biggest problem. Again, the bass drum is facing front, so I'm having to twist my torso in order to kind of get into a symmetrical position in a way. Yeah. I went through it, and it, because I've been studying mechanics so long, like right when I started studying this, I went through a gigantic fanboy phase of Mike Mangini. And it wasn't like, a lot of people got into him because of that whole, like he had a crazy drum set with all the toms, which you mean really cool and unique looking. But that idea of the ambidextrous playing really started to focus on the idea of creating everything around your body and playing symmetrical, you know, no crossing over. Now, there are some actual like really interesting brain reasons why learning how to play left hand with your right bass drum doesn't work so good. But the one thing that I think is a great takeaway from people like Mike Mangini, if you've ever seen Travis Orban on YouTube, he's done a great job of this, is that they create a setup that is extremely body-centric. And I think it's important to take notes from their body-centric drum set ideas and then put it into your drum set. Because when we sit down, I mean, in my opinion, this is the perils of most sports drums and instruments is that we have this body that has restrictions and availability. It, has, it can do certain things and it can do some other things. And that's kind of it, the extremes. And then we take these instruments that we found you know, in the last couple hundred years and we position them around us and we place them in a way that are usually like, hey, this looks like a jazz drum set. This looks like a rock drum set. Well, this five piece has these two pins in the bass drum. So I should probably put the 12 and 13 inch, well, whoever plays with the 13 tom inch anyway. But you know, it, this is where I should probably put this thing. And everyone that's ever bought a drum set, like the Pearl Exports and the common thing, that's where they put them. But we have to get away from that and build it around us. And once you do that, that's where everything starts to feel better. I mean, Mike, you can probably relate to this, but if you ever put an instrument in a spot that you had to work extra hard for and you realize, oh, I shouldn't have put that cowbell though. That kind of sucked, right? You're sore, your arm's tired. You're, you know, it's just awkward. So to answer your question, I think a lot of people are making that mistake and it's just the easiest place to start. What about snare drum height? I see a lot of really low, really high. Like, is there a spot that makes the most sense, you know, physiology? Physiologically, is that the term? Physiologically. Physiologically. <laughs> Physiologically. Yeah. I mean, there is a there is a soundscape component. I mean, you being someone who does so much stuff under the microphones, you know that certain positions and orientations might yield different sounds and effects depending on what you're going for. The easiest thing I can come back to is following our Goldilocks zone. So you want to make sure, first and foremost, that when you're striking the drum, actually, one step back. When you hit the drum, depending on the size drumstick, I actually have this thing called a dynamometer, which measures the net force reaction between two things. So if I take, a, if I take the dynamometer and I push my finger into it and I take it away, that will show me how much force happened between the dynamometer and my finger. So when I did that, it says 10 pounds. It means that the net force in between the plus and the minus was technically zero, but it took 10 pounds of force to stop it from moving. So I took, I, you know, I called the guys uh, to Dario. They sent me some Promark sticks and I did an experiment. 
And we took some 7A maples all the way up to those fire grain marching sticks. I can't remember what model they are, but they're insane. And so when I hit the drum with a 7A drumstick and I did a bunch of different strikes, like I did a full wrist strike, finger stroke, molar technique, a bunch of different things. But it ranged that the 7A would get somewhere between 15 and 22 LBF pounds force per strike. And the fire grain sticks would get anywhere between 35 and 45 pounds of force per strike. Even the bounces we're getting 35 pounds of force. Now, most of us know that if you have good technique, which is extremely broad, but you mean that you're efficient, you can move the sticks the way you want to, you get the sounds you want, and your hands are not taking all that force, we're not really getting 45 LBF when we hit the drum into our hands. But if we are in a position that forces us to be in a compromised joint position or skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle position, excuse me, that's where we start to get experience more of those forces. So on the snare drum specifically, this is for all drums, but for the snare drum specifically, we want to be in a position where you are as close to neutral, close to neutral with your wrist when you hit the drum. So I have enough range of motion availability, both from the wrist joint and the fingers to actually help me absorb the force. If I hit something firmly and my wrist is actually in a bit of extension when I hit it, I have less shock absorption availability available. If I'm in a fully flexed position, I'm in the other end where I might actually start squishing my joint and compressing some muscles in a shortened position that might actually cause some unwanted close to carpal tunnel like syndrome. So I would recommend that snare drum height. There's a few different things to consider, but the simplest is anatomically try to make sure that you are in the closest to a neutral position when you strike it. And what's interesting about that is if you are someone that is hitting the center of the drum consistently versus someone who is doing rim shots consistently. If you're consistently doing rim shots, that's where we might actually want the snare drum not to be flat, but slightly tilted by just five degrees. So when we actually hit the rim and the drum, the drumstick actually lands flat, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Versus when it's flat, we can probably get away with actually hitting the middle of the drum or angling it just a little bit more. But not many of us have to think that hard to go back to thinking the old Metallica days where Lars had the snare drum close to a 45 degree angle. And that truth, like, I mean, he was able to play that thing very well. He did good. I don't think he's got any wrist issues at all. But when you've got that drum at that 45 degree angle and I hit the snare drum, if I don't hit the drum at the exact angle of my wrist here and I'm hitting it at all like this to try and get the rim shot or my wrist is extended, that creates a ton of potentially of that 45 LBF going back into my wrist. Base the snare drum placement based around a neutral wrist position as best as you possibly can. And this goes with all the other drums if possible. There's some slight variances, but yeah, that was a bit long-winded, but I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that thought of, of probably every time we hit a rim shot, we're having to flex our wrist the wrong way. And that's yeah. eventually very dangerous. And I think if you get someone who's recording themselves with like a 120p camera and we can actually like bring the frames down so we can actually see that, I mean, we would see that they're probably doing just a little bit of extension each time. Mm -hmm. And so I actually have, like I, I set up, a, um, I actually set the measuring tape and my snare drum, I think I got the numbers right there because I just did a thing. It's 27 and a half inches on the one side and 27 and a quarter inches on the other side. And it's just that, that slight difference, but it's just enough that when I hit the snare drum, no one would visually notice. It looks like it's flat, but it's just enough that when I hit it, my wrist is completely straight and helps a ton. All right, let's get to some listener questions. I got a ton of questions in for this week. Obviously, we're not going to get to all of them, but I've got a few here I definitely want to hit on, um, two of which I ended up sending over to an expert friend of mine to answer so I wouldn't feel like I was just guessing. But the first one here was a really interesting one, the only one that came in via email. All the rest came in through Instagram, but if you do have a question for the show, just shoot them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. That's the best way for me to keep track of everything. If you want to DM me on my personal page at Mike Dawson Drums or uh, at Drum Factory Direct, that's cool too, but uh, they might get lost in the shuffle. So your best bet is to email drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. All right. This came from Elijah Steele. I am a 15 year old drummer looking to a future career. I would love to be a full-time gigging drummer. However, I also want to be a family man, so to speak. And I know those two kind of collide. Spending quality time with wife and kids and touring for months on end, I'm sure, is hard to pull off. 
I also would need a bit more of a steady income to provide for them as well, if you know what I mean. Anyway, my question is, what are some ways I might break into the other side of drumming, like other drum jobs not involved in playing a set every night or stuff like that? A couple paths I've been thinking about is starting a drum shop or building drums on a more personal and custom level. Then on top of that, when should I start the process and how would I start to build that business and become recognized for whatever I would be doing? Man, Elijah, you're only 15. So here's here's my response as an old man. Um, don't worry about all that yet. You're 15. When I was 15, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. I wanted to be a rock star. And in the back of my mind, I still thought I was going to be like a brain surgeon or something. So, and then what did I end up doing? Music journalism was my first full-time career. Didn't plan for it. It just happened. So my first response would be just seek out experiences right now. Play as much as you can. Uh, practice as much as you can. Join as many ensembles and get as many reps on stage as you can. Um, get into studios with your bands and start recording. If you have access to studio gear, just start tinkering with it yourself. Um, get into other art, photography, videography, explore other things. Play sports if you're into it. Not to be a professional, but just to experience everything. Because um, then you never know what's going to happen when you're 18, when you're 21, when you're 25, when you're 35. There's going to be opportunities all throughout for you to kind of pick your choose your destination. I don't want to speak onto the family thing because that's totally personal. Um, I do know just from friends of mine, it's it's really important to have a, a relationship that understands what's involved. If if you are going to be touring, you got to find a compatible person that that can that that works for them. Um, but that's that's not my not my area. I think that stuff kind of works itself out. But as far as the career side. Just seek out as many experiences as you can right now. Just try everything in music, outside of music. Um, if, you, if you live anywhere near anything in the, in the music industry, an internship would be cool. Um, if there's a drum shop nearby, part-time job, just packing orders or warehouse work, anything. And then once you get to college age, is when maybe you can start choosing a little bit more. But at this point, I would just say try try everything. Just go seek out opportunities to explore what you can do in music. I wouldn't make any any firm decisions right now. Like I said, I wanted to be all those things. And then when I was 23, I wanted to be a jazz drummer. What did I become? A full-time music journalist. So you just never know what's going to happen. So don't worry about it. Enjoy these years, practice as much as you can, just seek out excellence and it'll all work out. Now, here's a question that came in through Instagram from Rick Drums 71 How can I get scratches off my shells if it's a veneer wrap? I actually sent this over to Chris Carr at Bucks County Drums and his response was, you could buff it with a pedestal buffer as long as it isn't too deep, or you can use a car wax buff. I have no experience in that. I'm going to trust that he knows what he's talking about. I don't even know what a pedestal buffer is, but if you have access to one of those, try it. So he says pedestal buffer buffer or a car wax buff. Give it a shot. All right, this one came in also through Instagram. It says steve3762. How do you get out of a plain rut? Well, I am currently in a plain rut. So I'll tell you what I'm doing, and I feel like the past couple of days I've no longer you know, hating everything I play or, or even like not wanting to play, seek out new music. I think that's the number one thing. Um, I, I think for as much as I hate the idea of Spotify and YouTube and Apple music, having access to those services is just every day. I'm just like spinning the wheel. What, what cool music can I check out? So I'm always looking for new releases lately. I've been checking out the playlists that they create. There's like, like, if, you, if I just searched Blue Note Records on Apple Music, there's probably 30 playlists of curated stuff that's all just amazing. That's been what I've been doing when I'm walking around the neighborhood. I take like a you know 40 minute walk every morning and I've just been picking random playlists or records or you know, just thinking of maybe a musician or a drummer that I haven't checked out enough. And I'll just search out something I've never listened to before. And inevitably something just kicks me into 
you know, being inspired to come back here and play the drums more. So I think everything that ebb and flows, um, I go through periods of, of hating myself as a drummer and then periods of being okay with it. Um, I'm still trying to get to the being satisfied with myself as a drummer phase, but that's what I do. I just seek out new music or new art, go to a museum, watch, watch an interesting film, just anything to get you inspired that doesn't require you actually hitting the drums. All right, I've got two more questions here that, that were related to cymbals. So I sent those over to my friend Nick at Nicky Moon Custom Cymbals. The first one is about um, the weight, you know, what does the weight do for the volume of a cymbal? I'm gonna let him answer it. So here's Nicky's response. What's up people, it's Nicky Moon and I'm answering a couple of uh, questions here for the Drum Candy Podcast from my buddy Mike Dawson. So let's see, what do we have? Sleep when I'm dead uh, says, does the weight of a symbol correlate to the volume or is it more about the type slash process? Yes and no. The weight does um, correlate to the volume in that the thicker the symbol is, the more mass there is. So there's the more bronze to vibrate, which means there's more sound to be projected. However, the shape of the symbol and the size of the bell has uh, equally as important uh, effect on the volume. So really, in order to increase volume, you would be considering weight, shape, and bell size and bell shape all together. So you would see like a really heavy, really thick um, symbol for like heavy metal, where you would notice it also has a pretty large profile and a large size bell. So you put all those things together. So yes, but there are other factors involved. So it's a little bit trickier than just the weight because it's never that simple when it comes to symbols. And the second question that came in was about, should I use gaffer's tape on my symbols to tame down any unwanted overtones? Adding gaffer's tape to ride symbols, washi ride symbols, yes or no? I say no, it leaves a nasty residue and it's really, really hard to get off. And then the area that's taped, like doesn't patina as the rest of the symbol does. So then it's like two tone when you pull it off. It's like a nightmare, it's really stupid. Here's what you do. You cut out like a piece of like thin foam or something. You put a little hole in the middle, maybe like about this big, a little bit bigger than the bell of the symbol and put it above the, the felt that the symbol is sitting on. So it's just enough to sort of touch the area around the bell just a little bit and then put the top on and then you can use the nut to tighten it down and get like more dampening or less dampening and there's no residue all right there's a free tip for me nikki moon do that all right thanks nick for your insight and i never have heard of that solution of putting foam under the bell to do some of the you know, take away the need for gaffer's tape i'm definitely going to try that we might even want to make a segment out of that and test it but yeah thanks nick so if you have any questions for Anyone that in the industry, I mean, that's kind of what we're here for. I'm reaching out to as many people as I can who are experts in their field when a question pops up that I think they would be best suited to answer. So just shoot them over, drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. I still have probably a dozen more we'll get through over the next few episodes, but that's it for this segment now. We need to get to our warehouse pick of the week. Since it is Labor Day weekend, we decided here at Drum Factory Direct to put together a Labor Day special, which includes one of our really cool 5x14 seamless aluminum snares. And we were talking about it, but what can we do to make this extra special? So I was like, why don't we throw in some options for wires and heads so you have a do-it-all snare drum kit. So what you get is the 5x14 seamless aluminum snare, which comes with a single ply coated batter. It comes with 20 strand German style wires. Um, premium throw off. It's got solid brass tube lugs, triple flange steel hoops. It's a workhorse of a drum. I've actually been road testing this thing for a better part of a year on gigs. Got it right here. This is the one I've been taking out on the road. So you can see it looks, it's just a beautiful drum, classic, real sharp chrome, really nice throw off here. 20 strands. Um, I've worn through through different heads. So I've got a an Evans G1 on here now, but uh, you know, a really, it's seamless. So I think I said that, but I'm going to say it again. Seamless aluminum, fantastic drum. Works for everything. But I said, why don't we throw in some 16-strand wires so you get a little less buzz for maybe quieter stuff or, or situations where you need more control. And let's go the opposite way and throw in a big old 42-strand so you can get all the big, you know, 
white noise that you could ever want out of a snare drum. If you're really smacking, playing really hard, um, so that comes with that. Also, we're throwing in a two-ply coated head, so if you want to try this drum with a thicker head, um, that's coming in with it it's for free as well. We're throwing in some straps and cord for the wires. We're throwing in a drum key, and the price isn't changing. So it's the original price of the drum plus all the extra bits, which is, to make sure I got it correct here, I believe it is $349.95. Let me confirm. Yes, so the Labor Day Special, the Dewall Snare Drum Pack, all for just $349.95. We have a limited stock of these. I think there's 24 or so of these. So go over to drumfactordirect.com. Again, and I'll repeat, it has a 5x14 seamless aluminum snare, 16, 20, and 42 strand wires. Comes with a single ply head installed. You get an extra two ply head. Oh, I forgot. We're throwing in some moon gel dampening pads as well and one of our premium drum keys. So that's all available, $349.95, drumfactorydirect.com. Now, if you want to hear the drum, here's a demo. All right, that is our Labor Day special for our warehouse pick of the week. You can find it on the homepage of drumfactorydirect.com. You can also search for uh, the aluminum snare. It'll pop up. But yeah, get them now before they're gone. I don't know if we'll ever get any more of these drums in. They are really fantastic. They're kind of sleepers. Like I said, I've been gigging with this for about a year. And in almost every situation, it, it sounds great. Only a couple times I need just a bigger, deeper drum. But in everyday gigging, it's 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 a workhorse so get it now over at drumfactordirect.com that's it for this episode thank you for tuning in if you dig the show please head over to itunes spotify wherever you get your podcast also youtube if you're on youtube make sure you like and subscribe um give us a five star rating i haven't uh, you know drop in some written review that stuff does so much for getting the show to rank higher when people just search for drums or drum podcasts uh, we want everyone to be involved so uh, appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next week. So we're going to let Eric send us out. See you next week. <laughs>